to our third and final uh, seminar in this uh, landscape ecology and management uh, series we have this fall. Uh, on behalf of the Blue Mountain Natural Resource Institute and the Eastern Oregon chapter of uh, Sigma Xi, we, uh, we thank you all for coming. Um, we began this uh, short series back in October uh, when uh, Danny Lee, Bruce Riemann from uh, Boise came and talked about, uh, gave us a landscape analysis of the uh, native fish viability in the Columbia River Basin. Uh, we continued in November with uh, uh, Steve Garman, uh, who uh, gave us a look at how landscape patterns and processes are linked in a general way. And now today we'll finish with a real life example of how landscape processes, specifically at disturbance events, um, drive patterns of species diversity. Our speaker today is, uh, is Andy Hansen from Montana State University uh, in Bozeman. Uh, Andy has been kicking around for quite a long time doing landscape work. Uh, he uh, finished his uh, graduate work at Oak Ridge National Lab in Tennessee uh, as part of one of the strongest landscape ecology programs in, in, in this country. Uh, from there, he postdoc in South Africa, taught a little bit at Humboldt State, postdoc again at OSU as part of the COPE program, and then wound up at Montana State in 1992. He specializes in bird habitat relations uh, at the landscape level. And uh, for those of you who are interested, I have a couple of publications of his um, uh, in ecological applications. If I wants copies of these, I can make, make copies. Just approach me after the meeting, and I'll do that. OK, the title of his talk today is uh, Mechanisms that drive bird species diversity in Yellowstone National Park. Let me introduce Andy Hansen. Thanks a lot, Jim. Great to be here. Yesterday, when Jim and I talked on the phone, I didn't think there was much chance that we actually all would be here, but the weather gods weren't as bad as uh, they might have been. I wonder if we might just go ahead and turn on the slide projector and uh, put on the first slide. It's actually kind of uh, fun for me to be able to, to give this talk to you. Bozeman is maybe on the other side of the inland west, and you're a bit on the eastern or the western side here. And I'll be curious to see if some of the things we're finding in the Yellowstone area have much applicability to the landscapes that you've been working on. Can't hear, huh? So uh, I'll talk a little louder. And uh, it turns out there's chairs and stuff up here. Feel free to migrate up if you care to. All right, this is Yellowstone National Park and the surrounding federal lands. Have you heard this referred to as uh, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem? Uh, that's a term, greater ecosystem, that <coughs> Frank and John Craighead originated some years ago to describe the range of the Yellowstone grizzly bear. I think, though, that uh, this term, greater ecosystem, has evolved and now denotes more so places where there are very strong linkages between ecological communities and human communities. Greater ecosystems perhaps are characterized by having nature reserves and then gradients in land use that radiate out from those nature reserves. And we often think of the, these sorts of places as some of the last refugia for native species, the real crown jewels of our native landscapes. But interestingly, and not um, without uh, coincidence, these places are growing very rapidly in human population size, likely because, at least in part, uh, of the, the natural beauty and the other amenities that are offered by these ecosystems. Lots of people that have the wherewithal to get up and move are bailing out of the big cities across North America and coming to places like this. So that raises a lot of questions about how is that type of human population growth influencing the ecology of these greater ecosystems? And then in turn, what are some of the feedbacks to the human community from that? What I'd like to suggest today is that um, several greater ecosystems might be characterized by having a set of biophysical attributes that cause them to be particularly sensitive to human population size. Um, that these biophysical characteristics lead to people tending to settle in just those parts of the landscape that are most critical for native species. 
Now, if we can understand these types of relationships between abiotic factors and biodiversity and human settlement patterns, that, uh, that gives us some better basis for trying to come up with management strategies that would try to sustain both the ecological system and the human systems in those areas. Well, colleagues and I have been uh, trying to, to understand what drives patterns of bird diversity in the Yellowstone system. Uh, we've, we've been focusing on the effects of natural disturbance and logging activities on landscape structure under funding from NASA. We've also considered how both of these, as well as abiotic factors, influence rates of plant productivity and consequences for bird abundance and diversity and also for bird population viability. And uh, more recently, we've initiated some pilot studies on the human uh, biodiversity interaction through time, from pre-settlement times up through various eras to present, and then trying to push forward, with a particular focus on environmental gradients, natural disturbance, and then human activities like land allocation and rural residential development and logging. Well, rather than talk in detail about any of those individual studies, I'd like to sort of weave them together into, into a story, into a story of, uh, uh, that more or less lays out our hypotheses and some of the linkages between people and biodiversity in Greater Yellowstone. And I'd like to do this in the context of a flight around the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, hence our, our, our title, uh, A Bird's Eye View of Biodiversity and People in Greater Yellowstone. Uh, it's a pleasure to acknowledge uh, co-authors in this work, Jay Rotella, Elisa Gallant, Matt Kraska, and John Wilson from Montana State University, and Raleigh Redmond from University of Montana, and Warren Cohen from just over west of you at Oregon State University. <coughs> so let's consider that we're in Bozeman, Montana. That's, uh, would that pointer be? Handy? Not right now. Well, I can get along without it. So Bozeman sits way up at the top of this. And let's just figure that we'll take a flight clockwise around the ecosystem. This is a shaded relief map from the back. It might not be obvious that the green are the low elevation areas and yellow are the increasingly high elevation places. And the main thing you would, if you were in an airplane flying around this and were looking back towards the ecosystem, you would notice that it's basically a high plateau that mountains and, uh, and high plateaus characterize the Yellowstone ecosystem. And these are periodically cut by river valleys that drain from the mountain areas down into the surrounding plains. Now, that fact alone, that this is a very topographically uh, structured system, I think is going to tell us a whole lot about the ecology of this system, particularly about uh, how climate and soils are distributed in the system and possibly about how biodiversity is distributed. So if we continue flying around, we'll come to this northwest section of the ecosystem. That's where our studies have been focused in this hatched area. Here again is Yellowstone Park. And now let's consider that we've landed in West Yellowstone and we're standing right here and we're going to be looking up into Yellowstone Park. <coughs> All right. Thank you. So hard to see from the back, but this is the overall ecosystem. And we're, we're basically looking right into the park from the west side. And so in this case, this is a shaded relief map. Blue is low elevation. Yellow is high elevation. And we're looking from West Yellowstone due west right into the park. This is the boundary between Yellowstone Park and the adjacent lands. And uh, <coughs> if you're close enough to see, you'd see that we're looking up the Madison River drainage and into the Firehole area and into the Geyser Basin where Old Faithful is located. And you'll notice that um, all this culminates in the, in the high Yellowstone Plateau. Well, it turns out that, as you'd expect, temperatures vary quite a lot across this elevational gradient. This is a map of mean annual air temperature with um, the coolest places being in light yellow, so up in the Yellowstone Plateau and su substantially warmer temperatures down in the lowlands. Growing season is about two months long up here and about five months down in the lowlands. We actually have some years up in Yellowstone Park where trees 
do not put on any annual increment. There's basically no growth in some years up high. <coughs> well, if we looked at the distribution of vegetation in this system, we'd see some correlation with topography and climate and soils. Um, again, you won't be able to see these things given our setting here, but uh, lodgepole pine forests and light green tend to dominate these higher elevation areas that are on poor volcanic soils. Douglas fir is found at mid-elevations on somewhat richer soils. And then sprinkled into the lowlands in the richest sites are um, aspen, cottonwood, and willow, these various deciduous communities. Now those cover only about 3% of the study area. For example, if you can see it all, orange is aspen, and it's just sprinkled around the lowland areas here. What about plant productivity? Well, that's depicted here. Uh, again, as you would expect, net primary productivity is very much lower up in this high, relatively soil poor uh, area in the Yellowstone Park. And areas of highest primary productivity are just localized patches in the lowlands, particularly where the good soils are located. So I hope you get the idea that uh, there's fairly strong abiotic patterning here that, that seems to influence the distribution of vegetation cover type and also influence um, site quality, plant primary productivity. Well, what we're curious about is what might that mean for distribution of species in this system? Um, it turns out that for those of us that are vertebrate ecologists, we have mostly looked at plant cover type and serial stage and structure as main correlates with patterns of bird species richness. It's true for, for, uh, for mammals and amphibians and so forth as well. Um, and it turns out, of course, that most of our conservation plans and most of our management plans are prefaced on vegetation cover type and serial stage really mattering. Uh, the spotted owl plan in this region might be an example of that. Um, in recent years, though, there have been uh, a small number of studies that have had some very interesting results in how abiotic factors might be influencing patterns of species diversity. Uh, just for example, this is what I think will either is now or soon will become a classic study by David Curry, who looked at vertebrate species richness across North America and look for correlations with a variety of environmental variables, most of them relating to climate. And he found various climate variables were strongly correlated with vertebrate richness. In this case, potential evapotranspiration explained over 91% of the variation in species richness, quite a high amount of, of the variation. Now, PET is, is, in simplest terms, a measure of the ability of the atmosphere to evaporate water. It's largely driven by, by the heat dynamics of the system. And Curry would suggest that this relationship is underlaid by the fact that, um, that systems that are relatively warm and have lots of energy can support larger numbers of, of species than those areas that have less energy. And that energy would both be that that would influence the um, the, uh, the thermal properties of the species, as well as energy that would influence primary productivity, which would in turn influence food availability for vertebrates. <coughs> now it turns out this has been sort of uh, developed into what's known as the energy availability Whoa. hypothesis. And I'd like to just uh, show you one overhead. This energy availability hypothesis is one of about seven of the major hypotheses that have been offered for explaining patterns of species diversity around the world. And uh, I just want to make the point that for, for almost all of these, you can, you can suggest that abiotic factors might either directly or indirectly influence these. For example, under energy availability, we just indicated that, that uh, characteristics of the atmosphere influence energy availability. 
Um, in terms of environmental stress or environmental stability, again, the notion is that climate or soils directly influences patterns of diversity. <coughs> Even for things like uh, disturbance as a structuring force for diversity, you probably are extremely familiar with the fact that topography and climate very strongly influences the expression of many types of disturbance. And so there's an indirect association between abiotic factors and richness via disturbance. And of course, disturbance strongly affects habitat complexity, another major hypothesis for what drives species richness. Um, so you can suggest that there's a good potential that climate, soils, topography underlay most of these, even biotic action interactions like competition. Uh, various studies have found that competitive relationships between species tend to change from one soil type to another or from one climate regime to another. <coughs> now I just came, I just sort of came across this last week and all of a sudden said, wow, for all of our traditional hypotheses on what structures species diversity, pretty much all have a strong potential of relating to climate, soils, topography. Now what's amazing about that is, uh, is how seldom any of us vertebrate people actually measure climate or soils or topography. Uh, and that this would suggest that possibly we could improve our predictive power for where species are going to be located by considering some of these abiotic factors. Okay, let's get back to Yellowstone and see if this makes any sense in that context. We've been sampling uh, birds across cover types and elevations and serial stages in the Yellowstone ecosystem. And what we've been finding is a fairly striking relationship between um, various measures of the bird community and elevation. Now, for example, if we just restrict the analysis to mature lodgepole pine uh, and look at the effects of elevation, so we're basically controlling for structural attributes and for cover type and looking at the effects of elevation, we see that uh, the total bird abundance is strongly correlated with elevation, of course, decreasing at the higher elevations. This explains about 50% of the variation in bird abundance, and the same is true with bird species richness, as indicated here, explaining about 64% of the variation. And it held, this relationship held for several of our individual species. Now, this is kind of striking because if we were all walking uh, on that west side of Yellowstone Park and we looked at the lodgepole pine vegetation around us, we'd be hard pressed to say whether we were above 8,000 feet or below 7,000 feet just based on the vegetation. The vegetation doesn't obviously convey whatever it is that the birds are responding to uh, along this ele ele elevational gradient. And uh, what we're hypothesizing is that either climate itself is directly influencing bird abundance in the system or abiotic factors are influencing primary productivity which in turn then is influencing food availability to insectivorous birds and influencing their abundance. Now I lay those out all as hypotheses because we haven't, we've collected the data to test those hypotheses but we haven't fully done the analyses. So hopefully uh, in a few months we'll be able to offer some more insights on specifically what underlays this elevational relationship. If we look across cover types, something most of us are more familiar with, uh, we see strong relationships as all of you would expect. We find that cottonwood, aspen, and willow have just about twice as much bird species richness and total abundance as any of the lodgepole pine cover types or sage or grassland. Moreover, uh, about 25% of our bird species specialize on those deciduous habitats. About 24 out of 100 species uh, are strongly associated with those habitats. Why might that be? Um, we're hypothesizing that it's because these deciduous habitats occur on the very best sites and are quite high in primary productivity, for one, but also these habitats have high levels of structural richness, many different canopy layers, for example. 
and that we're suggesting that there's interesting interactions between vegetation structure, which we've all spent a lot of time studying, and things like primary productivity. And that uh, our high elevation lodgepole sites, beautiful old growth stands, lots of structural complexity, there's no birds in them. We think because primary productivity is so low that there's simply no food available for the birds. On the other hand, a lot of the lowland grasslands are in good soils, very high rates of primary productivity, but again, low bird species richness. We're suggesting because there's relatively little structural complexity there. And the interaction of high levels of structure and high levels of primary productivity might um, explain these, these so-called hot spots for bird abundance and bird species diversity. <coughs> Well, how might this play out over the landscape in terms of influencing patterns of bird species richness? Well, this figure is one that, that we're, we're sort of proud of because it took a lot of work to produce it. it uh, it's an uh, extrapolation of bird species richness across our study area. And we developed it by first uh, quantifying vegetation patterns over the study area using Landsat imagery. And then sampling birds, as I said, uh, in about 100 sites that are stratified by cover type and serial stage and elevation. And then developing statistical uh, functions to predict bird species richness across the entire landscape. Now places that are white here are low in species abundance and uh, species richness. And the deepest reds are places that are highest in bird species richness. You'll notice again the outline of Yellowstone Park here. If you could see this well and looked at where are the places that are deep red, first thing that strikes you is not much of this landscape is deep red. Species richness is not high over most of the landscape. And the places where it is relatively high mostly is outside of our crown jewel of national parks. <laughs> most of it's at lower elevations on those better sites. Uh, a third thing you might notice is that these hot spots are small in size, and they're quite isolated from each other. They tend to be peppered out, suggesting that connectivity among, among them might be a real issue. <coughs> this map, I think, has a lot of implications for management and conservation. And I'd like to come back to that near the end of the talk. But right now, let's, uh, let's continue on our, on our flight. And let's get back in the plane and take off from West, West Yellowstone and just fly up over that Madison Valley and up over the Yellowstone Plateau past Old Faithful and take a look down. Um, what we would see is an incredible amount of that landscape that's been burned by wildfire. So we're now circling around this area. As you probably know, about 40% of Yellowstone Park was burned in 1988 through wildfire. And the pattern that was inflicted on the landscape by these fires is fairly interesting. Most of our weather fronts actually come out of the Snake River drainage and push up to the northeast. And hence, the fires mostly were initiated on this side of the system and basically blown in long, narrow tongues across the ecosystem. Well, what that did was leave lots of elongated, fairly large patches of unburnt forest in the system. Those are places that uh, where colonists were able to survive the fire and probably hasten the recovery of those adjacent <coughs> burn patches. Now, big fires like this, according to Bill Rami, have reoccurred about every 200 to 300 years in this system. And it's a system that very much is dependent upon crown fire, a variety of plants like aspen, and of course, variety of animals like uh, blackback woodpecker um, require these types of fires. And this is a classic example of a dynamic landscape where natural disturbance is, uh, is shaping a mosaic of habitats through space and time, maintaining native species. <coughs> well, how do, how do humans fit into this landscape? <coughs> Let's start with the earliest homesteaders. It's kind of neat in that system, maybe here too, where you can still see the earliest cabins that were built by the homesteaders and get an idea of where they actually had settled. And uh, 
the impression I get is that the settlers tended to first occupy those places in the landscape that had the more mesic climatic conditions, the better soils, uh, access to water, and so forth. So mostly these, these lowland, more riparian-oriented settings were probably the first occupied. And that our current patterns of private land ownership largely reflect that habitat selection uh, criteria that was used by the early settlers. Towns like uh, Bozeman, won't be able to see that, but uh, this is the Gallatin Valley, and it's a very productive setting. Pretty much all the large towns in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem are located in these very fertile, low elevation valleys. Well, where did the national parks go then? Well, by default, uh, they were placed at the higher elevations, the sites that had not been settled by the earliest people. And to, uh, to sort of <coughs> demonstrate that, this is just a frequency distribution of land ownership by elevation. So red is private. And we go from low elevation to high elevation. And you see a majority of private land is at these lower elevation areas. The green are uh, national park lands in the ecosystem. And they tend to be at these higher elevations. One result of that is this gradient in human land use from the high elevation to the low elevation areas. <coughs> if we continued our flight down to the south side of the Yellowstone and flew up or along the west boundary of Yellowstone Park, we'd look down on this. Basically, the uh, Yellowstone Park and the boundary with the Targhee National Forest, where there's been quite extensive uh, clear-cut logging in this system. Well, it turns out that this logging, we, we tried to reconstruct what places were cut first. And so each of these panels reflects a decade from 1950 to 1990. So during the 50s, the orange are the places that where the initial logging occurred tended to be down in these lower elevation areas. Again, the park is over on this side. And then gradually pushed up to the park boundary. But the really heavy cutting wasn't until the 1980s up against that park boundary, suggesting that, that typically we've tended to uh, have our, our most intense land use at lower elevations and gradually have moved up over time. Well, what are, the, uh, what are the consequences of this type of clear-cut logging compared to wildfire in this system? One of the things that's kind of neat about Yellowstone is that you do have in intense gradients in human activity right aside of intense gradients in natural disturbance. It's a nice setting for making comparisons. <coughs> well, some of the things we're finding there fit very closely with what I, I'm sure you're um, well-versed on in this setting. And that is that natural disturbance like wildfire often leaves a lot more biological legacy within stands, which probably hastens recovery. At the landscape level, we're finding that um, landscape patterns differ quite a lot under wildfire and under logging. For example, that mean pat size is significantly more variable under wildfire than logging, as evidenced here by significant difference in coefficient of variation in pat size and also variation in core area. And then we found similar results for, for patch shape. Of course, that variability in patch size and shape are some of the elements of landscape heterogeneity that are probably important for keeping um, a variety of species with suitable habitats across the landscape. So we'd suggest here that the heterogeneity instilled at within stands and across landscapes by natural disturbance uh, supports a very different set of ecological processes and species than those that would come from traditional, traditional clear-cut logging. Here, for example, uh, in blue are the areas that have been clear-cut in the Targhee, and in red, the places that have burned by wildfire in the park. Now, <coughs> I'm sure you're all familiar with this notion of uh, range of natural variation as a guideline for landscape management. You know, the notion being that if we can understand what the pre-settlement disturbance was and the pre-settlement landscape dynamic was, that uh, if we can tend to stay within that natural range of variation, we should be able to maintain ecological processes and native species that had persisted under those regimes in pre-settlement times. 
How does that idea fit in a Crown Fire ecosystem like Yellowstone? Well, we tried to get at that a little bit by using a computer simulation model to reconstruct vegetation patterns over the, the past 200 years or so in parts of the Targhee National Forest, and then also use that model to project landscape change into the future under different um, forest management scenarios in the Targhee National Forest. Just for example, this depicts uh, about 50-year intervals from 1790 to 1988. And the greens tend to be older cereal stages, and the oranges and reds, younger cereal stages. And what our model uh, predicted was that most of the landscape tended to be late cereal in the late 1700s, and that in the mid-1800s, there was uh, quite widespread wildfire that converted most of the landscape to seed sapling and pole age stands. Those tended to grow into mature stands by the 1950s, and then the logging from 1950 to present tended to revert that and push the landscape back more towards an early cereal condition. So if you just plot one measure of landscape pattern, in this case the percent of mature and old growth vegetation cover from 1790 to present, what you see is uh, most of the landscape being mature and old growth until the big fires in the mid-1980s where most of it was early cereal, and then a recovery back towards that um, later stage, and then some decrease with modern logging. So here's the uh, so-called natural range of variability <laughs> in, in mature cover, going from about 15% <coughs> to about 95%. And uh, here are five different alternatives in the Targhee Forest Plan projected out from present 200 years into the future. Looks to me like all the five of those alternatives are within the natural range of variation. And they go from a no-cut scenario to a very high-strength logging scenario. I guess the, in a system like this, the suggestion is that it's just way too simplistic to think that being somewhere within a, quote, natural range of variation is going to accomplish our modern <coughs> objectives. That we really need to carefully consider the spatial scaling, spatial patterning, of that natural disturbance regime, we need, con need to consider the temporal scaling. But even that, I'm going to submit, isn't enough that we really need to think about these environmental gradients that we've been talking about and human land use patterns and try to merge all those together to come up with management scenarios that we think will best accomplish our current landscape objectives. No. Our, our, our model doesn't have a fire component to it, so there's several limitations in this model that we could talk about later if you, if you care to. <coughs> so I guess I'm going to come back to the notion, that, and I think it's something that those of you that were involved with the Columbia River assessment um, have hit on some time ago, that we probably really need to think about specifically what are our goals for the landscape and try to use first principles, if you will, to design that landscape to accomplish those objectives. Natural disturbance offers a good context, but it's some simple notion that we can stay within a pre-settlement range of variation probably isn't going to be very helpful to us. All right, so let's get back in that airplane, and now we're going to fly north and come off the Yellowstone Plateau. We're looking due south now, so we'll be coming down off the mountains down the Gallatin Valley, and, and this is the valley that Bozeman is set in. Um, <coughs> we'll notice that the land use will change pretty much from um, forest management at the higher elevations to agriculture as we get into the lowlands, and then more and more to rural residential development, and then to urban down still further. Now, as I mentioned earlier, in much of the northern Rockies, there's been a tremendous surge in human population in the last couple of decades, uh, largely due to so-called urban refugees, those people that have enough money to leave Chicago and Miami and LA and come to these greater ecosystems because they're such attractive places to live. Um, pretty much all we know in Greater Yellowstone is that they're coming, 
but there's been almost no quantification of how many are coming and where are they settling and how are they influencing the ecosystem or how are they influencing the local economy. We, uh, we did a bit of a pilot study just within this region south of Bozeman um, covering much of the Gallatin Valley up to the foothills here and this is the national forest boundary right here. And through aerial photo interpretation, tried to reconstruct rates of rural residential development over the past uh, 40 years or so. And I just want to show you a series of, of aerial photograph from one place to get an idea of what types of change has occurred. And you might focus on this riparian strip of vegetation right here. You'll notice here in uh, 1959 that most of the valley bottom here was in agriculture with just scattered uh, ranch houses. Now if we look 20 years later, 1979, here is that, that same strip of riparian vegetation. And you'll notice that a subdivision, a large subdivision has gone on right adjacent to that riparian zone and also some along this riparian zone. The uplands still tend to be mostly agricultural. And then if we look in uh, 1990, we see that, again, here's that riparian strip, that the, the development in the riparian zone is still expanded, but quite importantly, even the high elevation bluffs are also getting subdivided at this point. Uh, when we look at the data in total, this depicts the number of family dwellings in this 80 square uh, section study area. In 1954, yellow being low density, less than 10 houses per square mile, and uh, red being the highest density, greater than 50 houses per square mile. And just to orient you, this is the city of Bozeman here. And of course, it scores high density early on. And then this is a major highway that goes down into Yellowstone Park, and this is another community called Gallatin Gateway. But otherwise, it was low density across most of the valley in the 1950s. By 1979, <coughs> you'll notice that the highway corridors had, had increased human density. But notice this, pushing down towards the foothills to the south, there's also an increase in density. And by 1990, there's quite a dramatic surge in rural residential development in this forest uh, valley bottom interface right up against the National Forest. <coughs> now, these data end at 1990, but we looked at, uh, at some county records, sewage hookups. So we call this the, uh, the fecal data set. Turns out that, <laughs> that the only way you can figure out how many houses have been built in that area is to try to dredge through the county records and see, <laughs> to see uh, what data they might have that's relevant. And in our area, for some reason, they keep track of sewage permits. And that's the way to track who's built a house, where. Anyway, what you can notice here, this red line is the cumulative number of sewage permits in this county from 1970 to 1995. Notice that since 1990, there's been quite a surge. <coughs> the rate of growth is, is increasing quite dramatically in that area right now. And I think this is typical for several places in the northern Rockies. <coughs> now... <coughs> I guess our core hypothesis is that people are not settling randomly in the landscape, but they're picking certain places to settle that, that are partially influenced by the ecological characteristics of a landscape. Specifically, we're suggesting that these areas that are hot spots for biodiversity are just the places where people are settling. And uh, for example, here we depict net primary productivity across the Gallatin National Forest and then into the Gallatin Valley, both the towns of Bozeman and Livingston here, you'll notice the highest um, primary productivity is in these lowland areas. And then here we have uh, relative human population density. And you can see a pretty strong uh, correlation between the darkest greens and the darkest reds, suggesting that people are tending to settle in, in these, these most productive places. Well, what are the consequences of that for native species? Well, obviously, to the extent that there is conversion of these hotspot habitats to agriculture or to rural residential, we're reducing the area of these 
hotspot habitats. But we think that there's even more subtle impacts that may be going on. Uh, for example, we're, we're quite interested in, uh, in bird population viability, and hence we've been studying bird reproductive success. And what we had expected was that these hotspot habitats, places where birds are very abundant and where there's lots of species, that they would also be places where there's high reproductive success, and that they could be population source areas, producing lots of offspring that would then move out into the lower quality habitats and basically maintain a viable regional population. Now it turns out that our cottonwood habitats were our hottest of hot spots. Where we had the most species and the most abundance. But when we went and actually sampled bird reproductive success, we had a surprise. Now, we did it both by using artificial nests, which is shown in green here, and by using real bird nests, which is shown in red. The, the trends tend to be the same um, among these two different types of, of study methods. But what you'll note here is that bird reproductive success was quite high in these aspen habitats, uh, one of the hotspot types, well above what we think would make it a population source area, where reproduction is higher than estimated survival rates. Look at cottonwood, however. <coughs> Much lower reproductive success, probably below what's necessary to maintain the current population. So this suggests that these cottonwood sites might be uh, sink areas. The suggestion being that not all hot spots are created equal. Well, what might it be about these cottonwood habitats? It turns out in our study area that all the cottonwood habitats are down in the agricultural land. They're along the larger rivers. They're surrounded by ag land. And it uh, turns out that, that bird predators, nest predators, are much more abundant in cottonwood. For example, black-billed magpie is quite substantially more abundant in cottonwood than willow and aspen. And the same with brown-headed cowbirds, which, of course, are, are brood parasites, much higher in cottonwood than these other two types. These are both species that do well in a mixed agricultural, semi-native landscape. And the suggestion here is, is <coughs> even though those cottonwood habitats haven't been visibly altered by development, just the fact that they're a side of rural residential areas and agricultural areas is altering the predator community and probably having a very large impact on reproductive success and bird population viability in these hotspot habitats. So let's sort of wrap things up here with <coughs> some possible uh, management conclusions. Um, I think it's quite intriguing that that people tend to be attracted to these sorts of greater ecosystems because of their natural value, but because of the socioeconomic profile of the people that are moving there, they tend to be folks that want to live out in those aspen groves and out in those riparian areas, that people are tending to settle in just the places that are most important for native species and uh, maybe loving the system to death, if you will. So the real question is, how might we manage a system like this so that we both can maintain ecological communities here, but at the same time, maintain human quality of life. And the socioeconomic uh, socio people are suggesting that those things are strongly linked, that our economy is doing so well, partially because of the natural amenities that are in the system. So there's a strong economic incentive to keeping the ecosystem healthy, is what a lot of economists would suggest in this area. Anyway, how might we do that? Well. Just some, some, some thoughts are, first, it would seem important really to identify these hotspots so that we can um, set up conservation plans that would allow us to maintain those habitats and those species that are dependent upon them. It's quite obvious. It's also important, I think, to know what actually causes those places to be hotspots. What are those underlying factors that cause certain places to be, to be good and other places not? If you know that, you can actually try to um, manage those places to enhance those values. If vegetation structure matters on high productivity sites, then maybe we can manage those places to maintain that. Uh, it's also important to use this knowledge for mapping 
these hotspot habitats because that will allow us to identify hotspots that we don't know about yet and it should allow us to identify potential hotspots, places that have the right abiotic uh, conditions but where vegetation has been altered. That allows us to try to use restoration techniques to bring those back into an appropriate habitat condition. And in this regard, I, I personally am quite excited about the idea of trying to use abiotic factors and primary productivity as new filters for conservation planning. Instead of only mapping distribution of cover type and serial stage, uh, we're thinking that we can learn a lot by also mapping climate, soils, topography, and using that as a basis for coming up with management regimes across the landscape. It's certainly important not to omit the, uh, the human component. It's important to know uh, what land uses are occurring where and what their impacts are because that knowledge with knowledge of the ecosystem can allow us to, to basically do risk assessments, determine which places in the landscape are most important for native species and processes, uh, which of those places are most likely to be altered by human activity, and, and hence evaluate those places that are most at risk, allowing managers to give them high priority for management activities. Um, we think that this type of knowledge is going to be helpful to a wide variety of groups. Groups like the Nature Conservancy have to decide which private lands to get conservation easements on. Knowing where the hot spots are and which are most under threat would help them. Similarly, county planners all across the Northern Rockies are just pulling their hair out, as you probably well know, because their counties are growing like mad, um, and zoning and planning is really un underdeveloped in a lot of these places. Uh, they don't know what subdivisions to approve and which not. This type of data could help them make some of those types of decisions. There's a lot of private landowners that actually um, consider biodiversity to be important and would like to know what strategies they can take to keep native species in their places. This knowledge would help them. And then, as a lot of you are uh, in federal agencies, uh, you're well aware of, of how this sort of information could help um, try to lead to coordinated interagency management where you would actually try to um, manage the upland national forest land in conjunction with some of these lowland hotspots in order to accomplish your objectives. Hmm. Well, I've, I've tended to try to couch most of what I said in terms of hypotheses because the definitive studies have not been done by any means in our system. More or less, I'm laying out what we think is going on. And what we really need is... Uh, is a lot more work to actually test these relationships and understand them. <laughs> We've developed various proposals for doing that and some of the key pieces of that, and I suspect they overlap a lot with the pieces of the Columbia River assessment, though on a much different scale. <coughs> uh, these pieces are laid out here. First, trying to, trying to reconstruct past interactions among people and ecosystems, understanding where people have settled, what impacts they've had, in relation to patterns of biodiversity. Using that reconstruction from past to present as a way to actually test specific hypotheses. <coughs> and then uh, whenever we try to look to the past, we always say, oh gosh, I wish we had measured climate every year. I wish we had measured where people are settling. Well, now that we know some of the things we like to measure, it's appropriate, it seems to me, to set up monitoring protocols where we now get that information. So two or three years from now, we have the information that we want to make these decisions. And all of this allows risk assessments to be done to sort of rate which places in the landscape are of greatest concern and most merit management and conservation attention. <coughs> Projecting alternative futures uh, seems important, using simulation models and other approaches to actually say, what would the ecosystem be like if we doubled the number of residents? in it? What would the system be like if we maximized commodity production versus uh, tried to maximize native species diversity? What would, be the, what would be the economic outcomes of either of those scenarios? And finally, it, it's obvious that uh, involving all the different stakeholders is critical in each stage of this sort of process to allow this type of assessment to go forward. <coughs> so I guess I'd just close by, by suggesting that uh, that there's some really interesting new phenomenon that are happening in the Northern Rockies right now. 
Some of these have probably played out in other places like the eastern U.S. in the past when we weren't able to study them. But there's probably a real opportunity here to try to understand these interactions and try to mold a future where we can both maintain these, these wonderful ecosystems that we all uh, have come to love so much, at the same time maintaining the, the human communities that are in those areas. Thanks very much.